Hello, and welcome to my presentation on the use and misuse of film in race topics. I'm your presenter, Matt Stevenson, out of the University of Tennessee in the Theory and Practice and Teacher Education Department, focusing on social studies. The purpose of this presentation is to provide a demonstration of the impact and challenges for using film in social studies classroom and to receive feedback for future research. The intended audience here uh, is current and future social studies teachers, as well as teacher educators and, of course, classroom researchers. I'm also looking to reach out to various stakeholders, including administrators, parents, and students, and, of course, this is for film enthusiasts in general. The agenda for this presentation is first to provide a very brief literature review and vocabulary overview for classroom film use. We will discuss the use and misuse of race imagery in recent memory and the use and misuse of film for race-based issues, particularly in the classroom. Uh, if this is the live version, we will then have some time for reflection on the next steps in research, uh, as well as comments and question and answer session. When it comes to academic sources dealing with this particular topic, uh, the two sources I've chosen to highlight are the Marcus et al. Teaching History with Film Strategies for Secondary Social Studies, as well as the Russell and Waters Cinematic Social Studies, a resource for teaching and learning social studies with film. Sources agree that social studies teachers are using film on a very regular basis. Even your own anecdotal evidence from the classroom, whether it's your classroom, whether it's teachers that you have trained, uh, whether it's teachers you have observed, or just as a student uh, who might remember your history teacher, knows that film is going to be used and that many times the films are not used effectively. Many of us have memories or stories of teachers who simply put a film in just to kill some time right? Uh, they put in a film uh, because it is Substitute Teacher Friday or something along those lines uh, where film becomes a filler rather than an active source for student and curriculum engagement. What exactly are we doing when we utilize films so we can ensure that the use of these films is not simply filler but actually being done in an effective way? One aspect about this is to understand what we are doing with these films. Why are we showing films in the classroom? Well, most teachers who utilize film in the classroom use film as a text. In other words, they're showing a film or maybe a clip from a film to substitute for other texts, such as a lecture, such as formative assessments, uh, such as an actual textbook. This can be effective, but only if it is done correctly and only if it is done with legitimate intent. However, Many teachers, even those with really good intentions, will show a film, and then once it's done, they'll simply say, see, did everybody catch that? Okay, let's move on. And so what ends up happening is the film is not actually supplementing a lesson, it's replacing a lesson, and because of the lack of engagement with it as a legitimate source, uh, it is not usually getting the method across, or at least not getting it across in an effective manner. And that's where these other details come into play. The other ways that film can be utilized, such as using a film as an analogy. This helps to develop interpretive skills. Using film to demonstrate historiography, providing multiple perspectives on a particular historical topic, Film as a depictor of atmosphere. This can create, as the Marcus et al. source describes, empathy for a historical time period or historical characters. Film can also be utilized as a springboard into discussion of difficult issues. Regardless of how the film is going to be used, uh, the film does need to have specific plans for that particular curriculum. In other words, you can't just simply put the film in and expect it to speak for itself. Uh, just like any lesson planning uh, in a social studies classroom or other classrooms for that matter, there needs to be a very intent method uh, by which this film will be used as a source in order to create better engagement, but also to make sure you are contributing to the academic discussion. For this, the best example that I've looked at is what's known as the Russell Method. The Russell Method, which again, relatively simple and you would think somewhat intuitive is something that often doesn't occur within the social studies classroom when they engage with films. This involves four stages. The preparation stage, this is laying out what exactly needs to be done with the film, what exactly is the curriculum this is contributing to, uh, what is the lesson ahead of time before we get to the film. A previewing stage, this involves both viewing the film outside the classroom for the teacher in order to understand what exactly you want to get out of this film and how you're going to utilize it, as well as discussing with the students in the class before the film is shown what they should be looking for. 
what they should, could expect out of this. There's the watching stage, which again, that sounds pretty intuitive. You just put the film in and you watch it, right? Well, not necessarily. During the watching stage, uh, this could be done asynchronously. In other words, students are expected to watch the film on their own. Maybe it's posted somewhere. Maybe there is an after-school viewing party. Uh, maybe the students are expected to access the film themselves. Uh, this works better if you were at a college library that might have subscriptions to streaming services, these kinds of things. Or this could involve watching the film in the classroom, which that consumes a lot of time, particularly if you're gonna to try to watch an entire film. I typically am a fan of watching the film in the classroom, and again, this takes a lot of time, um, but I always preface this with my students by saying, I will show the entire film as long as you accept the fact that I'm going to be talking through the entire thing. Because watching the film uh, itself needs to be an active process. Simply putting it in there and expecting it to speak for itself for two hours or more uh, is, again, not going to be an effective strategy. And this, of course, is followed up by the post-viewing stage. This is where there is a discussion and an assessment of what was seen. Uh, this is not in either of the sources, although they both talk about uh, what is necessary for the post-viewing stage. Um, but for my personal practices, I like to stick by the rule of however long the film is you're watching, you need to spend at least that amount of time discussing the film. That means if you're going to show a two-hour film in the classroom, you better be prepared to have two hours of discussion thereafter. Once again, this is a lot of class time. Can you devote that kind of time to a particular topic? If yes, hit it, go for it. Uh, if not, then maybe you need to cut this down to just a few short clips. You show a five minute clip, a five minute conversation, this can be contributing very effectively to whatever other lesson plans you have in place. But this needs to be very well planned out and very well thought out before engaging with the film in the classroom. At various times throughout this presentation, there will be references to advanced placement standards. Uh, this is the national standards uh, that will be the guiding point for the purpose of these pedagogical strategies. Uh, however, feel free to employ these strategies uh, as you see fit in your social studies classroom. The first question to always address with students when presenting feature films as historical representation is what kind of sources are these? Are these films, in fact, primary or secondary sources. Now, when dealing with the actual subject matter, uh, for instance, the film Amistad, talking about the Amistad incident of the late 1830s, early 1840s, students should be able to recognize that this is in fact a secondary source. Uh, Jimon Unso is not in fact Cinque, regardless of how good his presentation of that character may be. Uh, these are representations uh, of historical events and therefore can never be primary sources of the time period in which they're looking. So the question then comes into play, how do we make these films into primary sources? Most pedagogical experts will recognize pretty quickly that these can never be made into primary sources about the historical events they are depicting, but they are in fact primary sources if you are considering the films themselves. In other words, the film Malcolm X is not only a secondary representation of the life of the political advocate Malcolm X, but is also a primary source of the 1992 film itself. Uh, it is a primary source of the film career of Denzel Washington. It is a primary source of feelings towards civil rights advocacy in the 1990s. These are the kinds of things that need to be addressed in order to fully engage with these films. Another important note to make on these particular films that I've chosen to talk about today uh, is their connection to the Advanced Placement Standards. Uh, in the APUSH, or Advanced Placement United States History Standards, there is very little mention of these specific topics. Uh, Malcolm X is not mentioned at all in the APUSH Standards. Uh, the Amistad and Jackie Robinson stories are also not mentioned in the APUSH standards. Martin Luther King Jr. does receive one specific mention when you get to the era on civil rights. Now, this makes sense uh, in the fact that American history is in fact a very large topic and very specific references are relatively rare for anything, uh, unless of course we're talking, say, President of the United States or a major war. This is where things become particularly interesting with the new advanced placement course of African American Studies. Uh, looking through the what is at this point in 2023 still a pilot program 
for the African American Studies in its first year uh, among 60 schools throughout the United States and next year being opened to hundreds of more schools, once again still as a pilot program. Uh, Malcolm X does receive 18 mentions in those standards. The Amistad incident receives three mentions in those standards. There are still no references to Jackie Robinson specifically, uh, but Martin Luther King Jr. does receive 17 specific mentions in these African American Studies standards. So when dealing with these films in the social studies classroom, we must be ready to recognize the constant dialogue moments that will connect the dots between the historical text we are trying to analyze and the historical presentation of these situations as we look at these films as primary sources. As we dive into our discussion of these films, we must of course acknowledge the tremendous diversity in the time periods and therefore context uh, we're going to need in order to fully discuss these films. All the way back into the mid-19th century with the historical storyline of Amistad, all the way up through the 1940s and 1960s with 42, Malcolm X, and Selma. But we're also talking about the production era of the 1990s versus the 2010s. Uh, very distinct time periods in their perception on these historical events. All of this, of course, adds in complexity to our discussion, but it also adds tremendous opportunity for greater understanding and classroom engagement. This Venn diagram gives a rough breakdown of the time periods that need to be considered when depicting a film like this as a text in the classroom. Any individual time period is going to be relatively surface, and again, going to be a text-based discussion, which can be helpful to students, but it does not give us a complete look at what these films have to offer in the social studies classroom. So the three time periods that must be considered first is, of course, the time period that is being depicted. The time period that's being depicted in the case of Selma, for instance, uh, is 1965 during the American Civil Rights Movement uh, in deep South Alabama. Uh, the Amistad case, for instance, uh, late 1830s, early 1840s uh, as a historical situation. We must also, of course, uh, in order to make sure that these films are put into their proper context, not just as stories of a historical portrayal, but actually of the films themselves and how they are made and how they are received, uh, we must look at the era in which the film is produced. But there's a third time period that needs to be engaged with and oftentimes uh, is missing when it comes to social studies classroom discussion, and that is the era in which the film is viewed. If we are viewing these films in 2023, then we are going to have a 2023 response to them. Even more recent films, such as, say, Selma, which is 2014, uh, is still going to have somewhat dated sensibilities. There are things that have happened that are going to be in the minds of both teachers and students that are not addressed, simply by talking about the period in which the film was produced and, of course, the historical era itself. Only by combining all three of these time periods in your discussion can you ensure effective use of these films as a primary source. The first film we're going to dive into here with a relative surface analysis, uh, just highlighting a few key points, uh, is the 2014 film Selma. When we're talking about the discussion of civil rights in the classroom, there's no question that Martin Luther King Jr. is going to be the dominant figure. He has been historically, and he will continue to be so, even as we shift from the American history uh, advanced placement classes into the African-American studies courses. But there are a few key points here that are worth highlighting in order for us to get a better understanding of what this film has to offer when being shown in the classroom, or if portions of it are being shown in the classroom, as well as some of the warnings that need to be engaged with. We need to understand what we're watching out for uh, and recognize these necessary discussion points in order for this film to be put into proper context. Some examples here uh, is the film Selma is actually relatively rare in the fact that it will actually depict Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, from an actor's perspective. Uh, if you look back to the filmography of the past 50 years, this again doesn't happen very often uh, with actual portrayals of Martin Luther King Jr. It's almost as if he's been deified and therefore we don't want to have some sort of false representation of this individual. This film breaks that mold here in 2014. Uh, we can hope that that uh, will continue to be a trend to come, uh, hopefully again as we have more and even better depictions in the future. Uh, the film does a good job in highlighting important SCLC leaders outside of Martin Luther King Jr. himself. 
Uh, here's just a couple of examples that are listed. Um, it is ultimately a very patriotic movie. Take a look at the screenshot here from the film Selma with the American flag waving in the background. Uh, the storyline itself, while it is critiquing the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, and of course state politics, it ultimately is very much in favor of the legislative power of the courts and Congress to actually achieve victory in civil rights activities. There is a pretty good discussion of the debates between the federal, state, and local politics. Um, it is one of the few historical films and Hollywood representations that is willing to engage with divisions within civil rights leadership directly, in this case represented with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SCLC and SNCC. And the part that I'm going to zero in on just a little bit is this movie has some of the best cinematic, quote, Easter eggs, if you know what you're looking for. There's some little tiny bits and pieces of this film uh, that are really spectacular nods toward other significant historical events uh, that are rarely covered in a film of this kind. Now, that said, the film has a lot to offer in the classroom. And again, this is not an, a comprehensive list, um, but there are also a variety of things that we need to be careful with, we need to watch out for, uh, and it must be addressed in a classroom discussion. First of all, the film does have a, quote, happy ending. This is one of the most frustrating aspects to teaching the civil rights uh, and to addressing civil rights, uh, it, particularly when it comes to film. Americans do like our happy ending. Yes, the film does acknowledge that MLK is assassinated three years after these events. However, it does seem to end on a triumphant note, as if the Voting Rights Act is suddenly the end of American civil rights. Uh, this is something that, once again, needs to be discussed in detail. The film definitely suffers from a consistent issue with a variety of films depicting black struggles in America, and that is the dangers of what's referred to as violence, tragedy, or perhaps even trauma porn. Uh, the violence of Bloody Sunday in particular, you really have to consider whether or not you're ready to engage with such imagery in the classroom should you choose to actually utilize this film. There are, of course, consistent misconceptions of historical actors. You're never going to get away from this uh, when it comes to Hollywood productions. There's always going to be some issues that make historical figures look one way or the other without fully engaging in that one. In this, in this film, uh, this kind of fits in best with the next point here, uh, is some of the interesting casting choices that are made. Uh, first of all, this film is overwhelmingly represented of British actors. Uh, the part played uh, for Martin Luther King Jr., for President Lyndon Johnson, and Alabama Governor George Wallace are all played by British actors, which is not necessarily a problem, but again, it does bring up some interesting points of consideration. Uh, but the one I'd say is the most uh, historically misrepresented in this one, or at least questionable in its representation, has got to be the actor Tom Wilkinson portraying Lyndon Johnson. Uh, it's, again, Certainly a personal taste in that case, but something that should be acknowledged as well. But the big issue, and the one I want to jump into right now, uh, is this film's perpetuation of what's been referred to as the, quote, Santa Clausification of the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., and therefore the, quote, Santa Clausification of the Civil Rights Movement. Put simply, this is the idea that Martin Luther King Jr. came with gifts, granted us civil rights, and then, of course, died for our sins. An article by historian Christopher Rounds in the Journal of Black Studies 2022 uh, covered a lot of this abuse and misuse of the image of Martin Luther King Jr. in our modern history. Uh, in his article, Dead Men Make Such Convenient Heroes, The Use and Misuse of Martin Luther King Jr.'s Legacy as Political Propaganda. So what I have here is a short video to give us some idea of the ways that Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy is used relatively flippantly uh, by some modern politicians. And when I hear people, you know, scream Black Lives Matter, I'm thinking, of course they do. But all lives matter. It's not that any life matters more than another. That's the whole message I think that Dr. King tried to present. And I think you'd be appalled by the notion that we're elevating some lives above others. I said Donald Trump has the lowest black unemployment in history. Donald Trump has the lowest Hispanic unemployment in 25 years. If you look at the policies of Donald Trump, okay, anybody, Martin Luther King would be proud of him, of what he's done to the, for the black and Hispanic community for jobs. So
Uh, you know, the hearts and minds of the American people today are thinking a lot about it being the weekend where we remember the life and work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But one of my favorite quotes from Dr. King was, now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. You think of how he changed America. He inspired us to change through the legislative process to become a more perfect union. That's exactly what President Trump is calling on the Congress to do come to the table in a spirit of good faith, we'll secure our border. We'll it's interesting to think about the perception of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, to be utilized for something like, for instance, securing our borders. Um, regardless of your political opinions on these representations, they are clearly misrepresentations. It's almost like the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. is used as a, as a shield against... This is what philosopher Cornel West will describe in an interview where he states... You, you know as well as I do that Brother Martin gets deodorized every January. He gets sanitized, sterilized, Santa Clausified. This is the concern that we are talking about when it comes to the perception of Martin Luther King Jr. historically, when it comes to his use, the use of his image politically, and of course, what we need to watch out for when we are utilizing films such as Selma in the classroom. And the question that comes up, of course, is are modern films doing any better? I do think Selma does a very good job in addressing things about Martin Luther King Jr. that might not otherwise be covered in the classroom. However, it is not a perfect model, and this is the kind of thing that needs to be considered by any teacher who is going to utilize this film. Now, that said, the film Selma also has some tremendous use of what's referred to as Easter eggs. These are the kind of things that are sort of hidden in the film to one degree or another, or maybe not necessarily the focal point of the film, that... Uh, do actually end up becoming very important points to recognize in the historical storyline. And it's up to the teacher, the instructor of the social studies class, to point these things out. So the first example is this is the only feature film movie that I've ever come across. Certainly there's been documentaries on this, but the only, first one I've come across that actually refers to the Albany, Georgia campaign, where they actually failed to initiate desegregation reforms in a city. The actors actually directly engage with these failures, and then the comparison with the relatively successful Birmingham campaign as they strategize for the Selma campaign two years later here in 1965. Another thing this film makes sure to highlight is the bridge where the march took place. Now, once again, this is a focal point of the storyline. It's kind of hard to avoid this, but there's no question that the filmmakers, or in this case, the camera work, very much wants you to zero in on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Not only is the history of the bridge itself significant, as seen with this image of the Ku Klux Klan marching across this bridge, but also the name itself. It's kind of hard to ignore. Once you see this, you've got to look it up, and then you realize, and you can therefore relate to your classes, the significance of that name itself, Edmund Pettus and his Confederate background. Another interesting engagement that Selma does, this isn't necessarily an Easter egg so much as uh, unique in the portrayal of this type of film, uh, is the relationship between George Wallace and Lyndon Johnson. What the film does a pretty good job of, and again, it's something you got to watch out for, is showing Johnson acting one way when he's with Martin Luther King Jr. and acting a very different way when he's in it with a different audience. So when he's with King, he is supportive of civil rights, uh, he is respectful, uh, his language is somewhat under control. Whereas in this scene, where he's engaging directly with Tim Roth, the actor played, portraying George Wallace, all of a sudden he's willing to drop in bombs. All of a sudden he's willing to engage in much more racist language. This is, again, not a major point of the film and something that could easily bypass somebody who was not paying close attention. It is definitely something worth pointing out. And again, I think a very good tactic that this film utilizes. As mentioned before, uh, this film engages with SNCC and its divisions with the SCLC. Uh, the characters of James Foreman and John Lewis uh, initially are resistant to the actions of Martin Luther King Jr. This is something that is a major highlight point, I think, for this film and something that, again, can sponsor significant engagement, particularly when it comes to our modern ideal of the Santa Clausification of Martin Luther King Jr. and breaking that myth is to see the divisions that occurred here in the civil rights movement. But my favorite by far of the quote Easter eggs uh, that occur in this film 
is during the scene of Bloody Sunday, when the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, their local and their SNCC allies, are first trying to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and they are brutalized by the police. It is a tra traumatizing, it is a traumatic scene. Uh, and they end up showing the reactions across the country. Uh, they show what will end up being a couple of characters who will join later, uh, a white priest as well as a white a woman organizer, uh, all reacting to radio or to televised broadcasts of what's happening here during Bloody Sunday. There's a comment during the scene that there are 70 million people watching this brutality. And then there's a very short moment where it zeroes in on this barbershop. And it's very hard to see unless you're watching very closely. But it says 317 Avalon Boulevard, Watts. This is 1965. By August of this year, one of the largest and most destructive resistant actions ever in American history will take place in Watts, what's referred to as the Watts Riots or the Watts Uprisings. And then the historical image here is of this, uh, this particular address, 317 Avalon Boulevard, burning as a result of this Watts Uprising. Definitely something that the filmmakers did intentionally, um, but also something that has to be pointed out by the social studies teacher if this point is going to be hitting home. Ultimately, Selma is a spectacular film to use in the classroom if you know how to engage with it and you know what you are looking for. This is just a small sample of things that need to be recognized in order for this film to be used successfully. Now, any civil rights discussion of Martin Luther King Jr. inevitably, especially in an African American Studies course, needs to engage with the quote, alternative. When engaging with the 1992 film Malcolm X, just like we did with film Selma, uh, there's a number of things that need to be considered. Uh, this film is spectacular and definitely needs consideration for use in both APUSH as well as African American studies. Um, but like any other film, there are issues with it that need to be dissected and need to be put out as discussion points. So this won't be as extensive a discussion, but I do want to make sure that the appropriate comparisons are here, especially because it does appear that African American studies courses are going to give equal time to Malcolm X and to Martin Luther King Jr., which is relatively rare in our social studies courses. So reasons why this film should be used, um, it is almost as engaging as an actual speech from Malcolm X. Denzel Washington has a spectacular portrayal of Malcolm X and is almost as charismatic as the real person. So this is something that, again, the film I think does very well. Um, this is very rare in films when it comes to humanizing of a radical. Uh, the historical perspective on Malcolm X often is that of a radical, that of somebody who is outside of the norm, uh, which kind of brings us to another point, which is the sort of uh, the opportunity to disabuse the so-called other civil rights guy image. Previously mentioned historian Christopher Rounds is actually currently engaged in research on people's perception and origins of their knowledge on Malcolm X. This is something that, again, comes about because of the overwhelming presence of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in our historical narrative. Uh, this film does a good job of demonstrating a very complex backstory, as well as very complex political developments. Uh, there's no white savior complex in this movie, as you will see in many other uh, historical movies about civil rights era. Uh, and there is a massive reading list to accompany this film. When this film came out in 1992, it sponsored a tremendous amount of literature, commenting on the film, commenting on its accuracy, commenting on its influence, these kinds of things uh, here in the 1990s. So there, you will have no trouble pairing this up with other secondary sources from this period. Things to watch out for in this film, uh, necessary discussion points that you need to engage with. Well, they're not all necessarily discussion points, but certainly something that needs to be considered. Uh, as mentioned before, this is, quote, almost as engaging as an actual Malcolm X speech. It's kind of hard to justify showing this film over showing actual footage of Malcolm X uh, and his speeches. Uh, so definitely something worth considering. This is one of those cases where the film is good, uh, but the historical primary sources are often going to be a lot better. Um, this is not a discussion point, but something that needs to be considered for anybody who's going to use this film. This is an extremely long movie. Uh, are you able to dedicate this much time to, one, showing an over three-hour film, but then the three-plus hours you'll need at least 
to discuss all the points necessary. Uh, that's going to be something that needs to be of consideration. You're probably better off uh, breaking up into significant portions. Inevitably, with this film, there's going to invite comparisons with Martin Luther King Jr., especially from a modern audience who has probably seen Selma, or at least is aware of a film like that. Uh, you're never going to get Malcolm X without that comparison of the much more famous and historically recognizable figure of Martin Luther King Jr. The film is somewhat dated in the 1990s, right? The political correctness of the 1990s is not up to standard with 2023, uh, particularly when it comes to issues of misogyny in this film. Uh, something that the film deals with better than most 1990s movies, but again, still going to be a point of contention. Uh, of course, there's always this characterization of other figures. Uh, Elijah Muhammad comes to mind in particular is, I wouldn't say necessarily mischaracterized in this film, um, but it does require a wider discussion to see how this film treats that historical figure in comparison to its protagonist. Uh, and one thing that, again, this is not necessarily a critique on the film, but something that is significantly more complex is the legacy of Malcolm X is not really addressed in this film, and I don't know how it could be. You already have a three-hour-plus movie, um, but that's going to be something where the teacher needs to fill in the gaps, right? The legacy movements that come out of Malcolm X and his ideas, uh, such as the Black Panthers. So with that in mind, I want to show just a, a very short clip here uh, from this film to demonstrate again how impactful this can really be in giving an alternative voice and demonstration through film on the civil rights era. All right, that's enough. I want these people moved out of here. Fruit of Islam are disciplined men. They haven't broken any laws. Yeah. What about them? That's your headache, Captain. But if Brother Johnson dies, I pity you. Doctor, he'll live. He's getting the best care we can get. Thank you, sir. All right, okay. Now let's disperse this mob. Too much power for one man to have. So what we have here is a Hollywood depiction of the Johnson incident of 1957. Uh, one of the most notorious and recognizable moments in Malcolm X's life. And again, I think this film does a very good job at engaging with this and could set the tone for a very fruitful classroom conversation. Next film for consideration for use in the classroom uh, is the 2013 film 42, which is the Jackie Robinson story. Along the lines of the biopics, uh, this is something that does somewhat shift the storyline of the civil rights era away from the very dense political commentary of Malcolm X and Selma, uh, and helps to gauge with a wider storyline, in this case, the use of baseball. Uh, this is an excellent discussion point for the long civil rights movement. Uh, that is the historiographical discussion that the civil rights era is not just simply 1954 to 1968. Brown versus Board to the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, but in fact is part of a long process that needs to extend decades uh, beyond that era. Uh, in this case, back to the 1940s and the immediate aftermath of World War II uh, with the integration of Major League Baseball. This film can contribute to part of the emerging literature on the cultural aspects of civil rights, in particular sports, media, and music. Uh, this is something that previously mentioned historian Christopher Rounds does deal with quite a bit. There is a modern representation in terms of Jackie Robinson Day in Major League Baseball. Uh, whenever you show this film, you could very well correspond this with the initiative of Major League Baseball in every April for all players to wear the number 42. Uh, this is a PG-13 movie, so you might be a little cautious with some of the younger audiences, although there's really only one particular reason, and that is its racial slurs, uh, that makes it PG-13. So there's a lot of this movie that you could show to a younger audience, uh, as it does seem to be intended to be somewhat of a simplistic discussion of civil rights era struggles. Which, of course, brings us for things to watch out for in this film. Uh, these are, once again, necessary discussion points. First of all, I find a lot of the racism in this movie 
to be very straw man racism. Now, this is something that is pretty easy to figure out in a lot of civil rights era films, uh, is the blatant and over-the-top racism of a few specific individuals who are not meant to be very complex characters. Uh, this, of course, is represented in this film with a lot of racial slurs. That is something you have to be very careful with uh, when utilizing this film in the classroom. Uh, definitely something to, to uh, have warnings about. Uh, I do find that this is somewhat of a simplistic storyline, as it does make a relatively difficult struggle seem a little too easy. In other words, just because this guy can play baseball, yes, that ultimately is why he's going to be more acceptable to mainstream audiences, but that is not something that is necessarily historically accurate in his representation. On that note, it does beg the question, what about the other 150 black baseball players uh, by 1955, the time when Jackie Robinson in fact retired? This is something that's not really dealt with very well in this film. But the one point I really want to bring up here is this film is all about the integration of African Americans into Major League Baseball, but has a very odd scene, uh, in particular that deals with perceived homophobia. Uh, it seems odd and questionable as to whether or not it is in fact necessary, and that's the scene I want to very briefly analyze here. Uh, what is happening in this scene is Jackie Robinson has already, in fact, been drafted by the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, he is part of the Brooklyn Dodgers winning team and their success, uh, and yet he still is feeling somewhat of an outsider uh, as far as his white teammates are concerned. Uh, and in this scene, uh, he is actually asked by his fellow teammate to come and shower with the team as a show of solidarity. But it's got a very peculiar feel to it. I'll let you guys watch this uh, and then give you my comments. Take a shower with me, Jackie. I, I didn't mean it. That came out a little wrong. I was not saying just take a shower with me. I was saying, why don't we all go and take a shower? Like, why, as a team, why don't we shower together? <laughs> Baraka. Yeah. Stop. Okay, this is an interesting scene for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's clearly one of these so-called no homo moments, which brings up the question of, is this quote, no homo moment for comic relief? If that's the case, that is incredibly insensitive for a film that seems to be dealing with issues of segregation. It is also interesting when you consider the timing of this film in 2013, uh, the potential commentary this film could be making and that is, while we are making so-called gains in civil rights in here in 1940 when it comes to the desegregation of Major League Baseball, are professional sports in fact ready for the desegregation in terms of sexuality? Uh, this film coming out in 2013 is interesting because it will be the next year, 2014, when the first openly homosexual NFL player will be drafted from the college ranks. Uh, into professional football. So, what is this film doing with this scene? Whichever of these interpretations you agree with, it is certainly something that is very potent for discussion. The last film I'd like to discuss uh, in terms of use in the classroom is the 1997 film Amistad. Uh, this is a significant divergence from the time period of the previous films, which all covered, relatively speaking, the civil rights era, this one is going over 100 years before this, back into the mid-19th century, and discussions of issues of slavery directly. Uh, so while certainly the time period is off in comparison, um, it is not that far off when it comes to our historiography of the 1990s and portrayal of race-based issues. Certainly this film, along with many of the others uh, that we've discussed, will be utilized in the African American Studies course. So why should this film be used? Well, first of all, cinematically speaking, it is absolutely an engaging and stunning film. Uh, it is spectacularly done, very well acted by its entire cast. I mean, just look at the names up here. Morgan Freeman, Anthony Hopkins, Jimon Onsu, Matthew McConaughey, all Academy Award winners, for whatever that's worth. Um, but definitely something uh, that is worth noting of this film. It is very well received. It is spectacularly performed. And again, visually very stunning. 
Uh, this is one of relatively few films that successfully depict the brutality of the Middle Passage. Uh, kind of in line with one of the first films to do that, which is the television series Roots, uh, this film does really pull no punches and has some of the most horrific scenes uh, of the brutality of the Middle Passage. So something, again, worth considering when it comes to engaging with that topic in the classroom. Uh, despite this brutality, and despite a lot of commentary on the complex political issues, uh, this film does still have very patriotic overtones concerning the laws in America's court systems. Uh, despite its very negative portrayal of Southern politicians such as John C. Calhoun, uh, the divisions within Congress that that would cause that would eventually lead us to the American Civil War, a pretty bad depiction and bad as in terms of uh, having a negative perception thereof of President Martin Van Buren, um, the film does ultimately come out with a relatively positive patriotic message that America's court systems will in fact uh, be the arbiters of justice. Uh, there's an interesting demonstration of the British anti-slavery initiatives in this film. Uh, there's one scene with a r rather pompous British naval officer uh, who, again, kind of scoffing and looking his nose down at the American people, is still talking in terms of anti-slavery. It helps to put into context that the British were, in fact, by this point, uh, actively pursuing it into the transatlantic slave trade. The black slaves in this film are portrayed with complex personalities and detailed backstories. Obviously, Onso is the best example of this, but many of the other characters around him uh, do give a pretty good depiction of people who, once again, are not just simply victims or simply uh, along for the ride in the story here, but are, in fact, uh, direct actors in, in demonstrating their own agency. Uh, and, of course, uh, this is a great demonstration of the historiography for these types of films of the 1990s, as we have discussed uh, with previous examples. Uh, there are a few things to watch out for in this film. Matter of fact, there's a number of things that should be watched out for and necessary discussion points, but I chose to highlight just a couple of them here. Uh, first of all, this film does have somewhat of a white savior complex. Now, we don't have the time for that here today, um, but this white savior complex discussion is something that in and of itself bears a very deep dive into, and it's definitely an interesting point to bring up here with this particular film uh, in the case of Matthew McConaughey's character. Um, but what's even more interesting uh, is the response around this film when Anthony Hopkins, who plays John Quincy Adams, receives a Academy Award nomination for Supporting Actor, whereas Unso does not. Interesting. I can't say whether that is justified or not. Anthony Hopkins certainly uh, is, is is kind of the star power that's brought to this film, um, but Unzo's performance is really hard to disparage. So definitely something we're talking about when it comes to the response of the Academy to this film. Um, as with all the previous films discussed, there are certainly stereotyping of characters, uh, historically speaking. Uh, the best example, of course, would be, say, the Southern character John C. Calhoun or President Martin Van Buren. Uh, there's definitely a lot of issues to be dealt with there. Uh, the previously mentioned demonstration of British anti-slavery initiatives, definitely something that is interesting to put into historical context. But it's also a pretty idealized version. Maybe this is meant to be sort of a representation of who would the British send to an American court system uh, and as a representative, you know, somebody who's going to talk in very high-minded ideals. Um, but you, as the social studies teacher, need to also discuss the shift of the British from traditional colonialism uh, into full-on imperialism and the distinctions that we see between, say, earlier 18th century versions and now we look into British 19th century versions. Their anti-slavery efforts were usually excuses for them to take over whole portions of Africa and portions of Asia. But the topic I want to hit on here and what makes this film particularly interesting in our discussion for its use in the classroom uh, is I want to use this to engage now with the dangers of using violence or trauma or tragedy porn in the classroom. This is something uh, that can be discussed in terms of what's known as the empathy and sympathy paradox. As some examples here, uh, there are certainly a lot of discussions on the pedagogical uh, issues or the dialogue that's going on over violence porn. And the reason why I use the term dialogue um, is I don't have necessarily a side to take on this one. I can't definitively say showing extremely violent scenes such as the middle passage scenes in this film is a good thing in the classroom or a bad thing. There are definitely arguments to be had on both sides, but the dialogue has to be considered and you need to determine 
what exactly you want to accomplish before you simply arbitrarily show such a brutal scene. Uh, for further reading, uh, you should definitely see Sardone et al.'s Exploring Sensitive Subjects with Adolescents Using Media and Technology to Teach About Genocide. So, for example, when we show these tremendously violent, albeit Hollywood-produced scenes, uh, our goal as teachers should be to produce empathy. Human beings are suffering. We should be feeling that suffering. And so by watching this violence, we can connect with these characters and perhaps think our discomfort in watching this scene is but a microcosm to the physical pain that is happening with these characters. We connect our storyline and our experience with what's happening with these characters. That, again, is the goal, is the idealized version. But what often happens is empathy instead with immature audiences can turn into sympathy, which is a questionable compromise. Certainly sympathy is still decent uh, as opposed to ignorance. Sympathy suggests that we do feel bad for what is happening, that we do pity uh, those who have suffered in such a way, that we do have uh, somewhat of a connection that we need to have this stop. But it also is very emblematic of the white savior complex. Uh, that's why I chose to uh, give this particular image here with the towering character Matthew McConaughey's uh, uh, playing the lawyer uh, over a short and scared black uh, black slave. This is sort of that image here that sympathy may in fact be pitying. Sympathy might actually be distancing as opposed to connecting uh, with the suffering that's taking place. Uh, it can be good. But it can also be very problematic. And we have to acknowledge the possibility that there is a danger with this violence porn in validating and or othering through this sort of demonstration. Now, the othering aspect to this is simply that somebody might see this scene, particularly once again, an immature viewer like, say, high school students or younger, might see this scene and be like, oh, this is what happens to black people. This is what happens to people in the 19th century. This is what happens to Africans. In other words, there's an othering. There's a, there's a distancing uh, with those who are actually suffering. Yes, we see this. And yes, it might not be good. Uh, but at the same time, it, it doesn't mean it, it almost is like it's dehumanizing the depiction of what happened as opposed to creating the sympathy or what we're looking for is the empathy. And the worst case scenario, of course, is the potential validating of this. We have to acknowledge the fact that there is a possibility somebody could watch these scenes and think that's the way it's supposed to be. That these are, in fact, a validation of historical situations. That is something that must be addressed in the classroom and should be called out immediately by a teacher-led discussion. So as part of a demonstration or part of a, a representation on this, this dialogue over violence porn, uh, I will turn to one of my generation's great poets and philosophers, Snoop Dogg. 12 years of slave, roots, underground. I can't watch none of that shit. The only success we have is roots and 12 years of slave and shit like that, huh? They're gonna just keep beating that shit in our heads or how they did us, huh? I mean, I don't understand America. They just want to just keep showing the abuse that we took hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But guess what? We're taking the same abuse. Think about that part. Again, somewhat an odd representation, but consider how your students could react to tremendously violent scenes like, say, Bloody Sunday in Selma, or, in this case, the middle passage scene of the film Amistad. So final considerations are the implications and potential next steps for research. Uh, this is something that, uh, again, I will be continuing to pursue when it comes to analyzing these films and their use, particularly when it comes to uh, the new advanced placement African American studies. So next steps, of course, would include classroom observations. How are teachers actually utilizing these films? The comparison between the A-PUSH and the AFAM curriculum, uh, the new African American studies, does open up new opportunities for discussion. Is that actually going to be distinct from what we had seen in the advanced placement United States history courses?
Of course, the implications here are for teacher training. How are we training and preparing our interns or new teachers to engage with these kinds of topics? Uh, how does this compare to, say, the college level expectations? How do college history professors expect their students to engage with these courses? And is this being mimicked in our high school equivalent college courses? And then, of course, consider your own experiences. Is this something that you have dealt with? Have there been situations where you have engaged with these films uh, that perhaps opened up your own perspective on how these things should be dealt with?